Um, uh, playing the card game engages offenders' attention and they quite like it. This is what happened before the first interview. 44% were extremely active, about 100 or more offences. 20% moderately active, 36% low active. So again, this is, it's a varied sample, but a lot of them are very persistent offenders. So, so far, it all looks a bit bleak. And now let's cheer you up. Because most of the offenders said they wanted to desist, even from the beginning. We asked them a series of standard questions, which, we, which were used at each occasion, and we gave them the same wording each time. The wording was, one, I have made a definite decision to try to stop. Two, I would like to stop, but I'm not sure if I can. Three, I'm unlikely to stop. And then, at interviews two, three, and four, I have stopped offending. Uh, combining these t definitely intend to stop and I have stopped, this is what you get. You start at 56 in the first interview, and it goes up. Uh, to 71 uh, by the end. There is a declining number uh, because of uh, interview uh, attrition, but we've checked and you can't explain that increase just by interview attrition. So there is a high proportion saying they definitely intend to stop even at the beginning, and that number increases. And even this lot includes some people who say, I would like to stop, but I'm not sure if I can, which I've summarized as would like to stop, but unlikely. And you'll see when I give you a case history in a bit uh, that uh, when people say that, they do sometimes, not always, they do sometimes really mean that they would like to stop, but they're not sure whether that's actually possible. So in general, We've got an incredibly persistent offender sample, but we've also got a sample that wants to stop. People often ask about drugs. A sample like this, well, they must all be on drugs, mustn't they? Well, no, they mustn't. About half of them were identified at the beginning as having a serious drug problem. And we're particularly grateful to the Australian Institute of Criminology for telling us that the key question is asking them whether they feel dependent on drugs. And that produced about, uh, as you can see at the end there, about 41% at the beginning saying that they were dependent. I'm going to skip this one and the next one quite quickly because what it tells you is things that will be rather familiar to you. Uh, start at the bottom. Uh, they've got a lot of mates. Their mates are very important to them and they often trusted their mates very, very deeply. But most of them said that their mates uh, were, that, that at least three quarters of their mates were uh, had a criminal record, and very often that criminal record was uh, a very substantial criminal record. Lots of them had girlfriends, and here we get into Samson and Laub territory, and we'll see a bit later that girlfriends are actually extremely important. Current living circumstances, there was a big surprise here. Although they're aged 20 to 21, 56% of them at the beginning of the study were living with their parents. And we will see later that what, that the parental influence is actually quite significant. Uh, and when we talked about this with the probation service, they said that's really interesting because we treat people over 18 as adults and therefore we never go and see their parents but actually their parents are potentially a quite significant pro-social influence on them. 
So uh, that's their background there. Uh, employment is dismal. Over half of them had had no, at the beginning, had no job of any kind in the last year. This will not surprise those of you who are familiar with offender populations. Enormous numbers of people had been excluded from school. Enormous numbers of people had left school without qualifications. A bit unusually, we asked them about driving in the second interview because by then we'd already picked up that quite a lot of them were quite interested in driving. And we discovered that only one of them had a full license and five had provisional licenses, making 5% of them having some sort of license. Uh, but 24% of them, in an unrelated question on criminal victimization, said that they had been a victim of someone to either taking their vehicle or taking something from their vehicle. In other words, there was quite a lot of unspoken association with vehicles uh, that uh, does, tends not to appear in official discourse uh, about uh, criminality. All right, that's what it was like at the beginning. What happened subsequently? Well, I'm going to tell you about two key outcome variables that we looked at. They were, first of all, official convictions, and secondly, self-reported criminality as you go uh, through the period. As regards official convictions, 80% of the sample were reconvicted, thus proving that ogres is a very good prediction instrument, because ogres predicted that 77% would, would be reconvicted and actually 80% were, and that's well within the margin of error. So good for ogres, up to a point, because what ogres doesn't do is tell you anything at all about the frequency of reoffending. And when you look over time at the frequency of reoffending, there is actually, over the three years of our study, a significant decline in the frequency of official offending in this sample. Interestingly, we have very recently started playing games with something called hierarchical linear modeling. Please don't ask me to explain this because it is beyond my statistical competence but I have a rough idea what it's about. What it's roughly about is trying to follow individuals through over time, tracking them uh, for s changing circumstances. We haven't got very far with the HLM analysis yet, but we have discovered, interestingly, that those whose official criminality decreases fastest over this three-year period are those with the highest ogres scores. Those who are not convicted at all are those with the lowest ogres scores, but those whose criminality decreases fastest are those with the highest ogres scores. Why? Because if you have a very high ogres score, you will have stacks of previous crimi criminality just before we pick you up. If you then make a serious attempt to desist, as quite a few do, then the slope of your decline in uh, offending will be fast, and it is. Which is a very interesting finding that I don't think has been shown before. So I'm going to tell you first of all about official convictions and then about self-reported criminality. Official convictions, uh, these are the results of the regression equations that we did, testing what factors are associated with official offending in the three years after our first interview. And this is for the whole sample, whether or not 